new day is rising Like an open door Hope is on the horizon We were made for more Clouds of our party Light shines like never before And we're just getting started We were made for more This is the light That we dreamt of and found It's a marvelous light Shines down Waves of mercy are breaking On a golden shore And heaven there for the taking We were made for more This is the life That we dreamt of and found Into marvelous light That shines down We will run the race that we've been given Until we reach, till we reach the end The fresh wind is blowing Something good is in store comes with the knowing We were made for more This is the life That we dreamt of and found Into marvelous light That shines down This is the life That we dreamt of and found into marvelous light that shines down He never has, he never will 
Man, it's so, such a powerful realization to know that there is a good, good God who loves us so much, who is with us. I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, I feel like, like, man, like, how am I supposed to, like, how am I supposed to even, like, how am I supposed to get through this day or get through this week or get through this moment. I think after you've been through enough stuff, you start to realize that there are things that come along that are just more than you. They're just more than you're capable of dealing with or outsmarting. But there's another realization that comes that there is a God who has never failed us who sticks with us through everything, who loves us just as we are, and who gives us the strength to, to carry on, and not just to carry on, but to overcome. This is not a, uh, this is not a just hold on and hope that you make it uh, kind of life that he's called us into, but it's a life of overcoming overcoming obstacles, overcoming challenges, overcoming things that you might be facing. And when we face those things, it is our moment to lean into him and into his goodness. So if you're facing one of those moments right now, if it's been that kind of day or that kind of week or that kind of month or frankly, maybe that kind of life, I just want to encourage you to lean in right now Sometimes that's just as simple as saying yes to God, saying, God, I want what you have for me. I want to live the kind of life that you planned for me. Maybe you want to just say that right now. I want to go where you want me to go. God, would you begin to just lead me into your path? My own leadership of my life has led me into some funky places. Maybe that would be your prayer tonight. God, would you just lead me? Would you guide me? Now would be a good time to pray that.
Or maybe you'd pray, God, would you just rescue me from this mess that I'm in? I'm not sure how I got here. But I know I'm not sure how to get out. such good things. You have such a good life for us. We want to enter into that fully, God. No matter what we think we know, no matter who we think you are, God, you are better and kinder and more loving and have even new adventures and new obstacles to overcome. God, tonight we want to be led by you, by your spirit, by your words. God, led by your goodness. Because you have been so, so good to us. Sing this together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able I will sing the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in the darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out today. Your goodness is running out, it's running out today. Your goodness is running out, it's running out today. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. And all my life, and all my life you have. 
All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God Let's go ahead and pray together. God, as we've sung, we celebrate the reality that it is your posture, it's your, it's your way that you pursue us, that you move towards us, and you do that with your goodness. And so I pray for all of us now that we would see greater glimpses of your goodness in our life, that it would be that it is coming after us. I pray for us as we're going through difficulty, that it would be your comfort and your strength that would come after us. I pray that as we are struggling to believe or to see ourselves the way you do, God, that it would be our identity that comes after us, that it would be hope that comes after us. And so fill us with the truth that we need and fill us with your goodness. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Terra Nova, you guys. My name is John, and this is Scott. Before you guys have a seat, we got a question. Hey, hey. Well, next weekend, next weekend, we've got this big barbecue we're doing oh, yeah. uh, after all of our services. It's like this party atmosphere, uh, and so we're going to be grilling burgers and dogs. And so my question for you is, if people are coming over, if you're hosting people, what are you eating, right? So maybe you go, you know, I like to grill too. Or maybe you've got this crock pot recipe that you, you like to do. Or maybe what you're eating is something that you order in because you're not cooking and everybody's happy about that. So, so my question oh, for yeah. you is, if people are coming over, what are you eating? So go ahead and uh, take a minute, turn to somebody, mm -hmm. say hey, introduce yourself, and then ask them that question. What a wonderful, wonderful weekend. It is great to have you again with us here at Terra Nova. If you're watching online, thanks for joining us. Hey like you said, this is John. I'm Scott. John, that's a, good, uh, that's a good color. That's a good color to wear. It looks really good on you. Uh, so, yeah, we'll Brings out my left tomorrow. eyebrow. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, once again, welcome, everybody. A great weekend. We've got a crew that's actually up at the Orange County Rescue Mission, Village of Hope, yep. serving a meal right now. Uh, we're going to be continuing our series, Renovate, and, uh, and it's just a great weekend to be here. And if you happen to be a guest with us, we just want to say a special thank you. Welcome. I hope you find what we do uh, just to be something that you connect with that is relevant and kind of resonates with where you're at in life right now. And, and hopefully, as everybody came in tonight, you had a chance to grab one of these programs, and we offered one of these to you. And so if, if you got this, you can go ahead, take it out. Pull it out, uh, open it up. You'll see lots of different things that are inside there. And as you take a look at that, this flap on the very back, this is our Connect card, you guys. I love hearing from you guys weekly. This is a way that you can share as much as information you want. Prayer requests, give us an update on life, what is happening. But we'd love to get this from you a little bit later. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and tear this out. Last week I had, a, or last time I did it, I had a perfect streak. And look at that. Hey, this no, is a big deal for me, you guys. Right, hey. I feel good about that. Nobody Thank like, you. Likes you know show what? Off, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, very good. So that's in there. See <laughs> if, uh, if your batting average is as good as John's. Uh, but another thing that you're going to find in that program is actually this, this flyer. Uh, it lets you know, hey, we're just two weekends away from Easter, which is wild. That's coming up quick. You'll see a bunch of different things on there. Uh, we've got this great Good Friday experience. Then we've got five Easter services that are happening at Terra Nova this year. Uh, you might notice you've got a card on your seat yeah. uh, laying out the five different times. And you'll see that four of those are actually times that we don't meet on a regular basis. And so you can figure out which time will work for you. Uh, if you've got little ones, you might want to uh, make sure that you're here for the Easter egg hunt. Or if you've got grandkids or people that you're inviting with little ones. Uh, and then maybe that Saturday 3.30 service will work out really well for that. 
uh, but you'll see on the other side of it that, uh, that we're actually jumping into our Easter team because as we're two weeks away, the thing that we're really focused on is building a great Easter team right now. Well, with that being said, you guys, this is something that we love to do as a community. Um, and like you said, we're actually hosting a party. So I'd love yeah. for you guys to invite your friends, your neighbors, your families. We have some to-go kits on the very back for you to egg your neighbor, which is really fun. But this flyer has all of the information that you're going to need. So spend a few moments just checking that out. Yeah, and when you, you're having a party, you're having people over, you just want to make sure their experience is like top notch that there's nothing that gets in the way from them enjoying their time. And that's our heart behind it. And so we're all the hosts and we want to create a great experience. And so yep. if you haven't already pulled this flyer out, uh, maybe do that right now. Or if you want to pull it open on the Terranova app, you'll see those all there as well. Um, but let me walk you through a few different things. And so I mentioned a, a moment ago that we've got this egg hunt that happens on Saturday. It's at two o'clock. And if you're willing to jump into that, I mean, we would love to have a great team to make that experience a, a lot of fun for the kids. And so you could serve there. Or speaking of kids, if you want to dive into one of our Supernova Kids classrooms, maybe you go, hey, year round, I don't know that I could do this every single weekend, oh, but, yeah. but I can do this for Easter because as our friends are bringing their kids, I want to make sure that their kids have a great time. And so maybe you jump into our Supernova Kids uh, classrooms and, and help with that. Or maybe, uh, maybe you jump in and you want to be part of our guest services team. I know, John, you lead that team. And Best and, team ever. Yeah, and so... Uh, we love, so anybody that has a big smile and a big heart, that's all that you need for, to serve on our team for guest services for that weekend. Which is why it's the best team ever. It sounds like great people. <laughs> sounds like great people. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so you can dive in there or maybe be part of our reset team. Or maybe you even notice uh, the second to last thing on there. We do this really cool thing uh, the Thursday leading up to Easter, we all descend okay. uh, on, on our space here at 7 Watney. Uh, you might hear us call it Super Serve Thursday. Kind of cheesy name, but the idea behind it is that we come together a couple days before our services are beginning and we get this place ready. We set up the chairs, we, we get the programs folded, we come together and we pray. We have pizza, which that's a perk as well. Love and pizza. So that's just a lot of fun. And so you might dive into that or really any of, of these different ways as we're forming these Easter teams. And as you're taking a look at it, just exit off. Somebody will uh, get in contact with you this week just because that's who we are. And we love to hearing from you guys as well. So thank you guys for being here uh, today. And uh, we're actually wrapping up, not wrapping up, we're at continuing in our series, Renovate. Well, hey, good evening. How you guys doing? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, as the guy said, we are continuing actually in part five of our series, Renovate to Make Old Things New. And uh, that means uh, we're getting towards the tale of the series. You're coming in late in the movie, as they might say. And so if you've, uh, you're kind of visiting us or new or new-ish, or you just haven't been here in a while, you might want to go back and check the previous episodes out at youtube.com slash Our Terranova, and you can catch up with us there. But it's a series about something that's called spiritual renovation, which we've been defining. Spiritual renovation is the process in which the inner reality of the self is transformed in such a way that the life and teaching of Jesus, the way of Jesus becomes the natural and everyday expression of who we really are. I love that definition. A simpler one, and one maybe more aligned with the lingo of this series is, 
It's the way our old self becomes new. Uh, the way you might say the way our, our, our me 1.0 self becomes my me 2.0 self, which by the way, we believe is the normal process for everybody who considers themselves a follower of Jesus, that this is what is happening in our lives throughout the course of our lives. And the whole thing is based on what is one of the most profound and maybe densest sections of what many people consider is one of the most profound documents in the Bible, a document that's actually a letter written by a man named Paul or the Apostle Paul to Jesus-following communities in the ancient city of Rome. It's known as the Letter to the Romans. And our jumping off point throughout this series has been this little part of the letter that I think everyone can relate to. In fact, it was written intentionally to create this relatability to it. And, and here's what he writes. I do not understand what I do. I don't get me sometimes, and you felt that way for what I want to do. I do not do what I hate. Uh, I do for I have the desire, hello, to do what is good, but not the ability to do so. For I do not do the good I want to do, but that thing uh, that I did not want to do, this is what I seem to keep on doing. And for some of us, it's really like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, that's in the Bible? That's kind of the story of my life, right? And he's describing what Charles Duhigg in his book, Power of Habit, refers to as habit dysfunction, or what philosopher Dallas Willard, in his book, Renovation of the Heart, uh, describes as a disordered soul, a disordered soul where Willard says the various aspects or the various dimensions of the self or the soul, and he mentions them as things like our will, our mind, our emotions, and our body. So our will referring to our choices, our intentions, our, in, our orientations, or that is the way we orient ourselves. Our mind, meaning our thoughts, ideas, beliefs, imaginations, inner conversations, our emotions referring to like sensation, feeling, mood, what mood are you you in, our body, of course, being our actions, words, habits, our behaviors, even our demeanor. And he says, in a disordered soul, the various aspects of the, or, or the dimensions of the self are like misaligned or misordered and are acting actually in opposition to one another. And Willard said, in the, dis this, the disintegrated or disordered life, the order of dominance of these parts begins with the body which is controlled by this thing we've been talking about during this series, flesh, or what Sigmund Freud called the id. It's my appetites or my comfort, my happiness, looks, stuff, pleasure, which becomes the end goal of my life. It actually becomes my God. And so we say things like, I just want to be happy. I deserve to be happy. We say to other people, you should be happy. You should do what makes you happy. Like that's the most important thing. That's the end goal. That's the God. And then everything else starts to fall in line to serve that God. And so my emotions end up being this tumultuous sea, riding the waves of my immediate happiness. You have ever been in this place where you're just up and down in anxiety and fear and pleasure, and it's my mood. What mood are you in today? My mind ends up just getting hijacked by all of that to justify the mess. And so rather than my mind directing my emotions it, it, my mind is consumed by them and just constantly turning out stories and justifications and self-deceptions of why it's all perfectly understandable and why this is just what anyone would do. The will, unfortunately, has abdicated its role to the emotions. And here at the bottom of the pile, it's weak, full of good intentions, maybe. I want to do the right thing, but it seems utterly incapable of carrying it out. And God, hello, if there is a God... It is a small and weak little G God who exists to serve me, to make me happy, to help me, to give me a good life. And sometimes we feel so frustrated with this God that we disbelieve in him. And that's maybe a good thing because that God doesn't actually exist anyway. And, and Willard says this disordered self this disordered life, it's the kind of thing that Paul is describing here in this section. In his words, living off of incoherent dreams and illusions, enslaved by their desires and bodily habits, blinded by false ideas and distorted images and misinformation, locked in a self-destructive struggle with itself and with others around it. Wow. Wow. That sounds a little extreme, but if you've ever been there, if you've ever felt like you were kind of there, you could probably relate to the next thing that Paul writes in this letter. What a wretched man I am. 
What, like, what did I, I'm so frustrated with myself. And maybe you felt that before. Who, he says, who can rescue me from this body of death? Who can rescue me from this life that's stuck in a cycle of not being able to do the good I want to do and continue to do the stuff I don't want to do? But what's interesting is he calls this his body of death. This body of death, which sounds kind of weird. Just put a pin in that for a second. And then he answers his question. Thanks be to God. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. That's, that's a who. Who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord? Which raises a question as we came towards the end last week. How? Okay, that sounds good. But exactly how does Jesus help us when we're stuck in this wretched man syndrome, this cycle, right? How does God set us free from that through Jesus Christ? And this is the question that he then sets out to answer in chapter 8, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus. Now, Here's why this is so important, because unless God, who is the source of life, has access to our hearts and minds, we cannot change, we cannot grow, we cannot really live. And so God does what he does in Christ, so that if we are willing to believe it and accept it, we can know, we can know that we know that even when we're failing, even when we're struggling, he doesn't leave us and he doesn't condemn us. And it's almost like this. Imagine yourself sitting across a table from God. And in the middle of this table is just this massive pile of everything that's messed up in you and everything you've ever messed up. And it stinks and it's ugly and it's embarrassing. And God's on the other side. And so throughout the conversation, throughout the connection, and he wants to connect with you, it's like you're trying to justify it or trying to like compensate for it. Or maybe you're just trying to hide it or hide from it or feel ashamed of it. And God, who loves you and wants to relate to you, finally says, you know what? Let me just clear this off the table. Let me just take all of that off the table for you. All of the mess and all of the feelings about it, all of the judgment, all of the condemnation, all of the compensation, everything you're trying to do that makes a genuine relationship impossible. Let me just take care of that. Let me just get rid of that for you so that we can relate as father and daughter, so that we can relate truly as father and son. And God does what he does in Christ so that if we are willing to, to believe in and accept it, we can know, we can know down to our toes that even when we're struggling, he does not condemn us. That is off the table now. And that allows us to open up our minds and our hearts to God, even while we're failing, because that's when we need him the most. Am I right? That allows us to stop leaning away from God when we fail and start leaning into him, to stop pulling away from God when we fail, which is almost a natural everyday response for us, to stop pulling away from him as we struggle and actually start pulling into him. Because if I think God condemns me as I'm condemning myself, if I think he feels about me like I feel about myself, then I will hide, I will cut myself off from him, the source of life, the source of the change that I want, and then I'll just fail more. I'll fail further. But if I know that God does not condemn me, then I can come to him. No shame, no judgment, no fear, no compensating. I can come to him wide open when I need him. Then Paul goes on to say, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened. So God's law, which he says, it's good. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with it. The standard's good and like it's all, what, whatever, all laws, religious laws, which may be good or may not be, your own ideals, however good they are, they are powerless to create in you the, the person that you were created to be constantly, as he says, constantly being sabotaged as they are by by the flesh. Now there's that word again, the flesh, which is a term Paul uses a lot and it's kind of weird. Okay, right? And he uses it in, in quite a technical sense, which we defined last week in two ways. First of all, it's my physical body with all its desires, impulses, and appetites, which is a neutral thing. They're not necessarily bad, but we all know that if you begin to indulge every desire, impulse, and appetite, you will not be healthy. 
for very long and your relationships won't be very good either. Like things go bad very quickly. And so though it's neutral, it trends towards, it trends towards unhealthy, which is where the second definition goes, the automated and ingrained or habituated, habituated nature of my messed up thinking, feeling, and behaving, how it has worked its way into myself. Now, what's interesting uh, is uh, in recent years, there's been a ton of research on habits and how habits really work. And part of the problem with with our struggle with doing what we don't want to do and not doing what we do want to do is that so much of what we do and feel and so much of our natural, what we might say our natural or instinctive emotional responses and behaviors are actually ingrained. They're automated. They're habitual. So much of life is lived on autopilot. In fact, I mentioned this book a moment ago, uh, New York Times investigative reporter Charles Duhigg uh, in his book, The Power of Habit, describes a study done by Duke University where they followed college students around for a number of days and they tracked all of their behaviors. They had these researchers tracking everything they did. And the question they were asking was, how much of what we do or how much of what they do is actual decision-making? People are making choices, deciding things. And how much of it kind of feels like I'm making decisions, but it's really just habit. It's really just automated, right? And their study, in their study, they concluded or found here was their conclusion that 45%, almost half of all daily activities were habit. They feel like we're making choices. I feel like I'm making a decision, but actually it's just habit. It's just automated. And here's the deal. Our consistent choices as we make them settle into our bodies as habits like Pavlov's dogs. You remember that study? Pavlov's dogs, they ring the bell, the dogs salivate. And just like that, Certain ways become conditioned for us, habitual. You don't think about it. You don't make an active choice, but you end up doing it even when you don't want to do it, even when you're trying not to. I automatically say these kinds of things. I automatically relate, uh, react like that. I automatically filter things like this, see things that way, see that person that way. I automatically feel this or respond that. It's like it's ingrained. It's habitual. It's what Paul calls the flesh this body of death. But now he says, well, what the law was powerless to do, God has actually done. The law was never going to ac accomplish this, but God has done it by sending his own son who took on the likeness of all our messed up humanity and on behalf of sin-sabotaged people everywhere, he condemned. He came condemning, but he didn't condemn you. He came to condemn, but he didn't condemn me. He came and he condemned that thing called sin living in me, living in the flesh. He sentenced that dark power living in you to death. And here's the point. In order that, in order that, all of the rightness, all of the rightness, all of the right things that God wants for your life, all of the things that deep down inside you want and you wish you could do and the person you wish you could be, all of it could actually happen, might be fulfilled in us who, and then he adds this line, who walk around, who live their lives, who walk around through their days, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, according to the spirit, who we defined, which we defined last week. He uses this term a couple of ways, spirit. On the one hand, that is God's very own life-giving presence and power that's always in the world, God's life-giving presence and power in the world and in my life. And then he uses a slightly different way to refer to the realm or the flow of that presence and power. It is his own personal active presence and power. And then there's this flow or this realm of that presence and power that, again, is always active. It's always available. It's always here. It's always now the flow of God's spirit. And for Paul, everything begins here. This is everything, like everything else we do as followers of Jesus, everything else we experience, this is the most fundamental, most basic practice of the Christian life. He puts it this way in, in another letter to the Galatians. So I say, walk by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. And here's the idea. The idea is that God's Spirit, His presence and power, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Imagine, it's filling this room right now. 
It fills this room. It fills your home. It fills your car. It fills the office. It fills the Starbucks as you're stopping by to grab that cup of coffee. It's like the air we breathe. It is always here. It fills everything as if there is, this, if, as if there is in this world a steady flow, a steady flow of the life and the power and the grace and the guidance of God. It is always accessible. It is always available. And you can either live your days detached from it, disconnected, largely unaware of it, not even conscious of it, unempowered, maybe even resisting it or pushing it away, unwilling, or we can learn to live our days in the flow in the flow of that life and power and grace and wisdom and guidance and renewal connected to it, consciously in alignment with it, agreeing, cooperating with it, empowered and propelled by it, walking in the spirit, walking in the spirit. For Paul, that's the whole ball game, not trying harder, walking in the spirit, walking in the spirit. Now, at this point, he's created this contrast, like these two opposite ways of existence, these two different opposite modes of existing, if you will, in the flesh versus in the spirit, who walk not according to the flesh, who do not walk in the flesh, but they walk in the spirit. Who, in other words, I'm no longer walking through my day just consumed with myself, with what I want, with what I need, with what I desire, with what I got going on or what I don't got going on, what I got coming, uh, coming to me or what I don't have coming to me. And I think we would all agree that is pretty much the normal mode of existence in Adam's race. Like that is how we all live, just thinking pretty much about ourselves all day long. No longer walking through my day in that mode, but instead living, living in and walking in the life and grace and power and guidance and desires of the Spirit, this presence, the flow of God's grace and power that's always here, always here. And this is the first step in reordering the self and reintegrating the self. It begins with, well, willingness. It begins with willingness, my willingness to cooperate with the Spirit, my willingness to walk with the Spirit. Now, what he says next and how this plays out is genius. It turns out there's a ton of research in recent years that has illuminated this for us. He says this, now, those who live according to the flesh, who are just in that mode of existence, they have their minds set on, or you could say they set their minds on what the flesh desires. On the other hand, those who live in accordance with the Spirit, who are walking in the Spirit, they set their minds on what the Spirit desires. In other words, when my appetites and my happiness and my impulses and my needs and my comfort become my God, the rest of myself begins to be ordered, or we might say disordered or misordered around that God, around that end goal. And my mind can't help but follow. My mind can't help but be consumed all day long with what I need and what I've got going on, my happiness or my unhappiness, however that might go. But if I begin to live my life governed by the things of the Spirit, by what the Spirit desires, love, and joy, peace, long-suffering, generosity, grace, asking God all the time, what is your spirit up to? Like, what are you doing, God? What is your spirit wanting? What do you desire? My mind will follow. My mind will be carried along and shaped by those things. Now, the word he uses throughout this section for our minds and how we think is really key to understanding what's, what, where he's, he's going with this. And the word, and he's writing in the Greek language to this community, we translate it into English. The word, the term he uses is phronema. Let me hear you say phronema out loud. One, two, three. Phronema, phronema, right. And it's, it's, it's not the word for a thought. It's not even the word for thinking. It's not the word for a, your mind. It's actually the term for a pattern of thinking, a way of thinking, a mindset, if you will, or maybe better yet, a mentality, a certain kind of mentality that you have. Now, cognitive psychologists tell us that there is a steady, steady, never-ending stream of thoughts flowing through our mind all day long, every day. Ideas, assumptions, imaginations, inner conversations, beliefs just flowing through the mind at a rapid pace. And here's what they say. Over time, that stream of consciousness begins to form certain patterns in our minds, certain phronemas, if you will, certain, certain types of thoughts that actually come to typify you, that come to typify or characterize your inner life. And so we use terms like optimist or pessimist. 
joyful or anxious, can do or can't do, forgiving or gracious or resentful and bitter. And this is exactly what he's talking about. This is what phronema is. In fact, when you describe a person in one of those terms, they're a really hopeful person or they're a really positive person or they're, they're kind of negative, they're a can do, they can't do, they're bitter. They're a, when we describe people that way, what we're really describing is their phronema the pattern of thinking that goes on inside them, their mentality, if you will, and how their phronema plays out in their actual lives. And what Paul is tapping in here into here is deeply true, that what I do shapes how I think, and how I think shapes what I do. What I do, what I do, how I walk through my life shapes my thinking, my patterns of thought, and what I think about and ruminate on will come out in my doing. They are totally interrelated. And the person who lives their life just driven by what makes me happy and what I got going on and what I need and my appetites, a distinct pattern of thought is established in our minds, and it's all about me. It's all about me and maybe me and my three because my children are an extension of me and maybe me and my spouse because in some cases my spouse is an extension of me or the things that are extensions of me, but it's really all about that. That is what it's all about, that. And my thoughts and my imaginations, my inner conversations, even my filtering, how I filter and see other people are all shaped by that way of thinking and that way of living. And on the other hand, the person who lives by or walks around as best they can just trying to walk in the spirit just trying to walk according to the Spirit and what the Spirit desires, they learn to set their minds, get this, to set their minds on what the Spirit desires, asking questions like, what's what's God's Spirit want here? What does He desire here? Man, I'm really frustrated. I don't like how this is going. God, what do you want? I know what I want. What do you desire? What are you up to in that person's life? I know what I'm up to in that person's life, but what is your spirit up to? Is it, are we in cahoots or am I at working at odds with you? Like, what is the spirit doing? Where is he giving life? And am I willing, am I willing to cooperate with the spirit? In this, setting my mind, setting my mind like a sail on a sailboat. As the wind is constantly changing, setting my mind, setting my mind to where and how the wind of the Spirit is blowing, setting my mind on what the Spirit desires. And now at this point, the reordering of the self has taken a very important second step. As the will begins to direct or set the mind toward the spirit. And then he adds this, the mindset, the mindset or the phronema of the flesh, it's, it's death. It's killing you. But the mindset, the phronema of the spirit, oh, baby, it is life and peace. Now, here's what's interesting. One of the findings of cognitive psychology is that every thought you have comes with a a little emotional charge, either positive or negative. A little emotional charge. Every thought you have either moves you up or down emotionally, one way or the other. Thoughts are never neutral. Letting your mind ruminate on something is never a neutral thing to do. And Paul is saying here that every thought comes with like a little spiritual charge, a little spiritual charge. Every train of thought you allow to continue, every inner conversation that you just indulge because it feels so sweet and self-righteous at the moment, every rumination, every thought has a definite spiritual charge leading you either to more and more life and peace, more love, more joy, more goodness, more generosity, more grace, more self-control, more faithfulness, or little by little, more and more to death and frustration and inner turmoil and outer turmoil and ultimately the death of the person that you were created to be. In fact, he takes this even a little bit further. He says, actually, the mindset, the phrenema of the flesh is death. The mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the flesh is hostile to God. These are opposite modes of existence. These are two opposite ways of being. Hostile God, which is really strong language, right? Your mind on the flesh is an enemy to God. It is at war with God. And we are like, I hear people say all the time, oh, no, 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 no. Like, I know I'm walking down this path and maybe I shouldn't be walking down this path or I know I'm kind of running with this stream of thought. Like, I got that going. I'm just gonna let that flow. But me and God, we're okay, Like, I'm good with God. We're good. And Paul would say, oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Your mind right now is at war with God. 
You are, you are at war with God right now. It does not, he says, it does not, it will not. In fact, it cannot in that mode do what God wants because it doesn't want what God wants. It isn't willing to do so. In other words, the difference between a life in the flesh and a life in the spirit, the, 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 a life where all of the rightness that, that God wants for us and that we really deeply want can actually happen naturally for us versus a life where all of that rightness literally cannot happen. It all begins in the mind. It all begins with the transformation of the inner reality of the self, with my phronema, how we think, not just what we think, not just what our thoughts are, but how we think, the patterns, the phronema, the mentality, intentionally set on the spirit, intentionally set on the spirit, inten an intentional way of filtering and focusing and feeding our minds. An intentional way of filtering and focusing and feeding that phronema, that mentality, that pattern of thinking so that increasingly the way of Jesus, the style of Jesus just becomes the natural expression of who we really are. The mindset on the flesh, it's death, guys. It's death. It is hostile to God. It cannot do what God wants. But then he adds this. I love this. He's always doing this. He says, but that's not you. That is not who you really are. You are not in the flesh. That's not you guys. You are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, if indeed the spirit is living in you. And again, he just brings us back as he does over and over again to what is true about you, what is really true about you. Here is what's true about you. And he's saying, so if this is what is true about you, and it is, then don't be something you're not. Why would you be something you're not? Be who you really are. And then he says this. Now, note, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not actually belong to Christ. In other words, there is no such thing as a follower of Jesus. There's no such thing as a Christian or a person who is in Christ who doesn't have the spirit of the Messiah in them. The, those, like if you are in Christ, and then Christ is in you. And that means you are now in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. And this is what's true of you. And then he says, and if that's what's true of you, if the Spirit of Christ, if the Spirit of the Messiah is actually in you, well, then even though your body is dead, because of that monster called sin, the Spirit gives life. Even though you still have this body of death, you have the same body, like you have the same body as you did before you were in Christ, habituated as it's become by everything that's messed up around you and everything that's messed up in you. But he goes, but guys, that is not how the story ends. That is not how the story ends. The spirit is the spirit of life. God is the God who raises the dead, and you don't have to stay stuck in that wretched man syndrome. He gives life, and he will give life to your mortal body. Here's where he goes next. And if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, and he is, he is, we already covered that, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also do the same for you. He's going to do the same for you. He is going to give life to that thing that you get so frustrated with, your mortal, fallen, frail body through his spirit who lives in you. To which many people go, well, yeah, okay, like after I die, right? So after I die, and then just as Jesus rose from the dead, then we're going to be risen, resurrected, and there will be a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth, and eternal life. And it's like then, right? So then, like that's when all this mess gets sorted out, and I don't have to struggle with this thing anymore. Then I'll be like out of wretched man syndrome. And that's kind of true, and we're getting there next week. But that is not the point that Paul has been making in this part of the letter. The whole point of this discussion has not been, so hang on till heaven, guys, and then it gets better, you know, eternal life when I die. He's talking to people who are saying, why can't I do what I ought to do? Like, why, why are my good intentions so darn ineffectual? Why do I struggle so much? Why, why am I so weak? Why am I such a, why do I do what I don't want to do even when I know better? Why do I say things that I swear I'm not going to say? And then I end up just spewing that why, why, why? And again and again, Paul has descri described this whole conflict as, it seems like there's something living in me. It seems like, <clears throat> seems like it's actually part of me. Like in my body, this 
body of death, right? It's my tongue, it's my resting face, it's my hands, my eyes, my feet, my appetites, it's this thing called the flesh. He's been asking, is there any way to be free from it? Is there any way to actually be free? Who will rescue me from this body of death? And now he's finally come full circle. Finally, he comes full circle to answer the question, not just of who, but also the how. The how this actually happens in our this lifetime life. And what Paul has been describing is what Willard describes as the reintegration or the reordering of the self, where these various aspects or dimensions of ourself or person become aligned, become properly ordered, open to the flow of God's life-giving spirit as God truly becomes God. Not at the bottom of the pile, but at the top. And as in Christ, I am learning to cooperate learning to cooperate, through, co cooperate with the Spirit and becoming who I am, learning to walk in the Spirit, to cooperate with the Spirit, there is a reordering, there is a reintegration or alignment, if you will, that begins to happen in me with my whole self that allows the life of God to flow freely in me and to restore me to my full and true humanity. And so Willard says, here's what such a person looks like. Here's what the reordered soul looks like. Here's what the integrated self looks like, where God, the creator of all and the source of my life, is the one whom I serve, not the other way around. He does not serve me, I serve him. And then the will takes its proper place in the order, and the will's role is to position the rest of the self and dependence on and devotion to God, to the flow of that life, and the will does so primarily by ordering and setting the mind. And it does so, by the way, back up, it does so through willingness, through this thing called, is that not on there? Is willingness on there? No? I deleted that, huh? All right, it's not on there. Okay, back to will. Uh, so it does so mainly, I'll add this for tomorrow, they just won't even know. Uh, it does so through willingness. Now, this is kind of important. Willingness, not willpower. So if you're taking notes, you just write that down. It's willingness, not willpower. Willingness, not willpower. This is different than me trying harder, exerting my will over, uh, you know, impassable uh, un, un, odds. It's just like, I'm willing, okay? I'm, I'm willing. In fact, sometimes as I'm struggling through something and I find myself locked in the struggle, I'll actually say, God, I don't actually know if I want what you want because right now I kind of want what I want. I kind of want my mind to go in this place. It just like I, I want to, to indulge this knuckleheadedness for a little while. I don't know that I want what you want, but I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing to want what you want. And sometimes I even go one step further and say, I'm willing to be made willing. I don't know if I'm even willing to want what you want, but I'm willing to be made willing, and just like that, just like that, the battle begins to break as I, with my willingness, start to align myself with what the Spirit might actually want. So the role of the will is to order and set the mind. The mind, the mind is set then on what the Spirit desires, which doesn't, by the way, mean we're not paying attention to what's going on around us, like heads are in the clouds, the old saying, too earthly minded to be of any, uh, too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. It's not that kind of thing at all. In fact, I'm very conscious of my physical, of current physical realities, maybe even more conscious than I was before because I'm not so consumed with myself filtering everything through the way it might affect me. I can actually pay attention to what's going around on around in my physical realities, but at the same time, I'm always, always, always looking beyond that, beyond my physical realities to the spiritual realities, always asking, Spirit, what do you desire? Spirit, what are you doing? What do you want in this moment? Can, can I cooperate with you? What are you doing? Because the Spirit is always flowing, He's always doing. How can I step into that flow with you and walk with you? The mind is set on what the Spirit desires. The emotions are then, in the words of Jesus, flowing with rivers of living water. That's Jesus' word for the emotions of the person who is living in the Spirit. Flowing with living water, or in Paul's words, the emotions are life and peace. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, grace, empathy, uh, generosity, and ironically, often happier than I was before when I was pursuing happiness. I'm often happier now that I'm not pursuing it because happiness, just so you know, is a terrible objective and a wonderful outcome. It is a terrible goal and a beautiful 
outcome if you're not pursuing it. And so I'm often happier. My emotions are flowing with living water. And then there's this thing called the body, the outward tangible expression of our lives, what other people experience of us, the me that other people see and hear and experience that had become habituated with everything that was messed up with me, now enlivened by the Spirit, the body becomes an expression of the life-giving Spirit to the world around me. As mind and body are reordered in the flow of the Spirit, in, in, an, an inner transformation of the self can really begin to take place such that the way of Jesus, the style of Jesus, increasingly becomes the natural and everyday expression in our bodies of who we really are. So, all the rightness that God desires and all of the rightness that deep down we desire is fulfilled in us, begins to be fulfilled in us, not by trying harder, not by gritting our teeth, not by willpower, but by willingness. Willingness as we walk according to the Spirit, as we learn to walk according to the Spirit. The renovation of the heart is first and foremost a spirit thing. It's first and foremost a God thing. It is something that God is doing in me, not something that I am doing in me. And I am learning to cooperate with the Spirit in becoming who I truly am. I am learning to cooperate with the Spirit in becoming who I truly am. I am learning to walk in the Spirit. Now, this process, this process, of course, as long as we are living in the old creation, which we are, it is never complete. And that is where Paul goes next in what many, many have considered to be the most powerful, the most beautiful section of this or any other letter he ever wrote. And so next weekend, I hope you'll come back for the series finale. It's Palm Sunday. We've got a barbecue happening after all three services, including this service. So come hungry, hang out. It'll be a It'll be great. We're also celebrating communion in the services. And so I hope you'll join us next week as we see how Paul ends this section so marvelously. Uh, before you head out, before I pray for you, just want to remind you to drop those connect cards that John and Scott were telling you about into the offering baskets. If you're a guest, we would love to hear from you. Thank you for being with us. You can just drop that in there as well. And uh, offering envelopes if you're part of the Terra Nova family. And then we would love everybody as we throw this party together, as we collectively host uh, all of our friends and family and, and community for Easter, We'd love to have you join one of our teams or check off a few of those boxes. And you can throw that in the offering basket on the way out as well. And you can sign up on our app and on, on online too. So uh, before you go, let me, let me just close this in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for doing in us and for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Thank you for loving us so much that you wanted to get the pile of mess that comes between us off the table and you just took care of it. You took care of the mess itself. You took care of all of the judgment and guilt and shame and condemnation and compensating and fear and anything that might go with it. You just took it off the table so we could relate to you wide open as our Heavenly Father. And if you've never made that decision to open your life wide to your Heavenly Father, I want to invite you to do that right now. He loves you so much and has gone so far to make it possible for you in this very moment to just say yes to him. Would you do that? To invite his spirit to come inside you and do in you what you can't do for yourself, to transform you into the person you were created to be. In fact, Heavenly Father, I pray that for myself as well, and maybe many of us do, that your spirit would flow freely in us, transforming us, mind, emotion, will, and body into the people you created us to be. And we thank you that that's what you're all about. You love to do it. And so we can trust you to answer that prayer. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, thanks again for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you got something out of it. On your way out again, you can drop those things in the basket. Stop by the Easter table, grab some of these invite cards, pass them around, invite some folks in a couple of weeks. We're two weeks out. And of course, if you got families with the kids, you can egg, egg them, do that whole kind of thing too. All of that's outside. Uh, God bless you. Have a fantastic week walking according to the Spirit. We'll see you back next weekend for the series finale.